Well, we have a lot of interesting stories and cartoons that come out around Christmas time. As a child growing up, I remember several of them, um, and I remember there was something very mystical about them and enjoying them a lot. One of them, and I think about two of them, um, and you all can help me out here a little bit, if we had two negative characters of Christmas, two main negative characters of Christmas, who would the two main negative characters of Christmas, who might they be? Oh, the Grinch comes to mind. You remember that? Remember that cartoon? For those of you that are around 50, 45, or whatever, there was this, there was this certain one, played the same one year after year after year, and I don't know why, I just, I loved it. I don't hardly remember the storyline, but here's the main thing that he does. He seeks to steal Christmas. He doesn't want it to come, right? Well, that's uh, one of the figures of Christmas that's negative. What's the other one that's really negative of Christmas? Man, you guys are good. Ebenezer Scrooge, remember that? Thanks to Charles Dickens, we have this glorious tale. Um, of a, of a businessman who is just an old grouch and simply doesn't see the point of Christmas. And he's greedy and he's heartless and all he does is worship his money and his things. And he, he really has a problem with the past. He's not given up on the pains of life. He's held on to them. And um, so, uh, one is seeking to steal Christmas. The other one is seeking to uh, just completely ignore Christmas because of his seeing it as so meaningless. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, this morning, I don't want to be a Grinch or a Scrooge, but I do want to be a faithful pastor who calls upon us to see some very important things um, as we come into this Christmas season. Um, you notice the message is entitled, Christ Mass, meaning and warning. Now, I'd like for us to say Christ Mass together out loud. Can we say that together? Christ Mass. That's the word Christmas. It's the Mass. It's the time of worship over the birth of Christ. It's the picture of celebrating the reality of Christ, the coming of Christ. Um, the idea of the Mass is not merely a Catholic time of worship. It is the picture of a coming together. It's the gathering um, in worship. And so, as we go into Christ Mass in these coming weeks, now some of you have already been there, and you have the scars to prove it from Walmart or Target or the mall or something like that. Um, but it, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, Black Friday, there's many people who, um, did you know that 50% of retailer, excuse me, 50% of retail purchases on Black Friday are thought to be ultimately for the purchase of the person who's buying them, um, which is a scary thought. Um, you know, it's the idea that, well, I can't wait to do my Christmas shopping for myself, you know. Um, and that's, that's often what we see in this. But it's so, so much more. And I want us to take a few minutes to, to calibrate ourselves a little bit for the next few weeks. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 are where we want to look. And look what it says in verse 4. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So my friends, as we come to Galatians chapter 4, we begin to see that this, this incarnation, this coming of Jesus is of ultimate importance. It's not just very important, it is of 
ultimate importance. It is, it is everything to us that we go from a spirit of slavery to sin to an adoption by God through the coming of Christ and the life of Christ that would bring us into the salvation of God. This is the true meaning of Christmas. This is the reason that there's lights. This is the reason that there should be joy. This is the reason that there's singing and rejoicing. This is the reason that there's feasting and modeling after the giving heart of God to us that we would give as well, that this is the picture of the celebration of our giving God. Notice number one here and fill this in. May we remember the big picture of Christmas. Now, you're going to be tempted to forget the big picture of Christmas when somebody comes home from the grocery store having forgotten what you, sit, what you asked them to bring, right? You're going, to, you're going to tend to forget it. Or you're going to be standing in a line somewhere, or you're going to be involved with something that kind of goes wrong a little bit in the busyness of it all and a bit of the pressure of it can cloud out the true meaning of it. We often experience this kind of displacement in our lives when other things from the world crowd in and crowd out the truths of God in our hearts. Notice this, and notice the line that's just underneath that number one. In love and humility, God the Father sent God the Son to die for our sins. Can we read that out loud together? Let's read that line out loud together. In love and humility, God the Father sent God the Son to die for our sins. So this precious little baby that we put in the mangers and that we look at in the pictures and that we have that is all around us, the celebration of this birth This baby was born to die. This baby was born to pay with his own life. And it's not just any baby that was born to do this. This is the sinless son of God, born of a virgin. The the inherited sin of Adam is not passed on to this Christ child. So this is God the son in all of his perfection coming to be the perfect sacrifice for a world lost in sin. And so we, we look at this, we, we see that his name is Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean except fill this in? God with us. This is God joining us. And not only the idea of the name of Emmanuel, meaning God with us, but the incarnation. What what does incarnation mean? That means God in the flesh. When we look at the doctrine of the incarnation, this is all of the study and all of the focus that Scripture gives us about God taking on human form. This is God putting on flesh. Now, when we sing these hymns of Christmas, you're going to see a lot of lines. We've just sang about six lines this morning already about God becoming a person. Now, um, I've always thought that this is really rather amazing, never really understood the importance of it until I started to really study the gospel a little bit more, study the Bible a little bit more, and I started to realize, oh no, it's not just about a little baby. This is about God coming in the form of man. Now, I've, when I was a kid growing up, some of you all have heard me say before that I remember growing up right over here at 2118 North 39th Avenue, and I had a sandbox in the backyard, and occasionally, um, my parents tried to get me out of the house as much as possible, and that was a good thing. Um, but they built me a big 10 by 10 foot sandbox around a tree, and I had all my trucks out there and everything else. And sometimes I would go out there to the sandbox and realize that the ants had taken over, especially if I left a piece of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich out there or something like that. They would just take up residence in my sandbox, and they'd drill a hole down into the ground, and they'd build their own colony, you know, especially if I was gone for a little while. And I would come back and, you know, have war with the ants, go get the garden hose, you know, and all this stuff. But I remember watching the ants a lot. I would just watch them. 
And I would sometimes try to talk to them, you know, like, leave, um, like, or, you know, what's it like down there? And it, and it, was, it was rather bizarre, but I remember being, you know, 50, 60-pound kid looking at these, these things that, how much does an ant weigh? And if you added them all together, how much would they weigh? Not, not very much, almost nothing at all. But a million times greater is the magnification of God coming to us than if I could become, a, I used to dream about what it was like to become an ant and be able to go down in the ground, be able to see all their little caves. I thought caves were cool. You know, I, I just used to think about what would it be like to be an ant? Then they obviously come up and communicate with each other. They obviously follow each other. They, they have, they're, they're really, they're, there's, a fair amount of relationship that they have in tasks that they do together. It's kind of amazing. You move a big leaf somewhere or peanut butter and jelly sandwich or whatever it is. I mean, they, they work together in this way. So I would, I would often think about, okay, this, this is a whole entity of people, not people, but animals that are here, insects that are here, and they're able to do all this. And, and I used to think about what would it be like to become one of them in a far greater way. This is what the high king of all of the universe who speaks and stars come out of his mouth. The one who creates all things. He looks down at this tiny speck in space. A tiny speck in space. Around one of millions upon millions upon millions of stars. Billions of stars. And he comes down and he joins us. He takes on human form to be one of us. So instead of shouting from the halls of heaven with his grand celestial megaphone, he comes and he takes on one of our voices and he joins us in our place. So this is God in the flesh. This is a big deal. This is a massive deal. In fact, I, I've kind of made a note to myself here saying the Old Testament believers, they were expecting the Messiah to come. They were expecting Messiah to come and to deliver them. They, them, they were praying for Messiah to come. They just did not realize that Messiah would be God himself. They were expecting a man to be raised up. They were expecting an individual to be raised up and to throw off the yoke of Rome or to throw off whatever these controlling, uh, uh, oppressing powers over God's people would be. It was a shock to them when this God would come in the form of a man and not only come in the form of man and not be born in a palace in Jerusalem or a great hall of, of power in Athens or in Rome, but to be born into a horse's stall outside of a little dusty town called Bethlehem. This is the amazing, humble incarnation of God, God in the flesh. In fact, Jesus, his own name, Mary and Joseph are told to name him Jesus. And Jesus, or Yeshua, means in itself, God saves. So in his own name, we see the purpose of his life. That as he comes, he is declaring with his own life, with his own incarnation, and his own coming death and resurrection, that this is the God who saves us. You cannot save yourself. God will save you. Now, that is where we begin to see a great difference between the truths of God versus the lies of a fallen world, the lies of human thinking, the lies of Satan's voice. Satan says you can save yourself. Satan says that through your good works and through your being a good boy or good girl, you, through, through all of your efforts, that eventually you can win God's approval, that you can overcome your sins by doing your own good works. And here we see the theme of the Bible is that salvation is from God, Amen. not from us, not from any man and not from yourself, not from any woman as bright or as beautiful or as powerful as she may be, that this is not what saves you. It is 
God himself. Well, I want us to see this from scripture observations. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, first one that we see here, letter A is, see our triune God in action. Our God is a triune God, right out there to the side, the Trinity. And we see it in Father, Son, and Spirit. In verse 4, notice what it says, but when the fullness of time had come, look what it says, God sent forth his Son. So the Godhead Father, Son, and Spirit, sends forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now look at verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent, notice the next one here, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. You see, When a person comes to faith in God through Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. We at one time did not have the Spirit, but when Pentecost comes and we see the Spirit fall upon God's people, fall upon the church, we see that it is God's plan all the way through the Scripture. We see that God now comes and dwells within the lives of people. And this is what we see in Galatians. Father, Son, and Spirit at work together for the salvation of His people. That it is the Spirit of God who draws us to Himself and empowers us to be the people that He's called us to be. So this is a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit working within Himself to bring about His salvation and His will. And letter B is The next part here is about his will. We see our sovereign God in action. In Galatians chapter 4, look what it says. And when the fullness of time had come, this is the idea that the, the, the time was just right. It was the right moment in history that God had made his promises through the Old Testament. He had made his promises to his people saying a Messiah will come and at the right time he will come. And we see this same phrase over and over and over again in Scripture. It shows up several times that at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Some might say, well, why didn't he wait till now? Wouldn't it have been a lot easier? I mean, he would have Twitter And he could get his message out a whole lot better. My friends, the Bible tells us that at the right time, God came to earth. Now, we can make up all of the reasons that we would say that. Well, it was the Pax Romana. It was the great Roman Empire that had control over much of the civilized world. They had built roads so the gospel could travel, not just Jesus to travel, but those who would follow Jesus immediately. That There was the Pax Romana that brought uh, the peace of Rome that brought common language, that that there was an order by which language would be um, all around, it would make it much easier, that there would be uh, a a clear understanding of power and imperial power that could be um, overlaid against the gospel, and all of these things would, would provide a framework for the right time. Friends, I don't know what all the celestial reasons that God did what he did when he came when he came. But I know that the Bible tells me that it was the fullness of time. It was the right time. Notice here, not only in the fullness of time, but born of a woman. So he comes in the right way. He comes in the way that would bring him the most glory. He comes to be flesh. So this has to do with him coming in the form of a human, born of woman, not born of an angel, not born of a tree not born of some other being, but born of his prized possession in creation, which is the heart of men and women. This is his plan. And he was born of a woman, we know, through a virgin birth, a woman who had never been with a man. This is showing us that he breaks the cycle of sin that Adam had passed down, by which the rest of humanity is plagued. So he's born of a woman in perfect plan, perfect time that he would come taking on human form. This is the sovereign God in action. Letter C, we see in these verses, four and five, we see that this is our self-sacrificing God in action. It's not that he's come to sacrifice somebody else. 
He's come to sacrifice himself. And this is key to the gospel. This is why we can rejoice that we have so loving and gracious a God. But notice here in verse 4 and 5, you will see that he's coming in self-sacrifice. But when the fullness of time had come, he sent forth his son. Imagine sending your son to be sacrificed. We see a God who sends forth his prized son, his perfect son, not deserving of anything. He sends forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, and look what it says in verse 5, to do what? To redeem. That means to buy back, to buy back those who are under the law. So here we are under the law, having failed the law, broken the law. No one has kept the law. We are all found guilty before a perfect God. And here he comes to buy us back out of our position of sinfulness. This is to redeem us, the self-sacrificing God in action. And then letter D, notice this. This is so beautiful. In D we see, in these verses, we see our merciful, generous God in action. We see that he is a generous God. He gives of himself. He gives his son. And this generous action is he takes sinful beings and calls them his own children by washing away their sin and adopting them. Notice what it says. Not just that you call him father, but do you know what the word Abba means? It's the idea of Papa or Daddy. How many of you called your children, I mean, called your dad Papa? Anybody call you? Some of you called him Papa. How many of you called him Daddy or Dad? Okay. Most of us called him dad or daddy. But if you're from other places, if you're from Russia or you're from other places, very often you, uh, the Caribbean or other places, you, we would often hear papa. In French, you call him papa. Um, in places in the Middle East, sometimes it's bobber. So you, you can call him bobber. But here we see that he is the merciful God who invites us into so an intimate relationship with him that we would call out to him daddy. How does a, a father love his own child? How does a father love his own daughter? He loves her with tenderness and joyfulness, and he loves her with deep affection and care. That there's a great intimacy that he has as he sees his precious daughter or he sees his precious son, and he rejoices in her. This is the picture of so generous a God that takes that which is sinned against him and said no to him and invites him in to, to be his own child that is precious in his sight. You see, Satan's lie that God is merely a wrathful God that has no interest except in punishment and condemnation is a lie from the pit of hell. Our God is a God of condemnation of sin and of condemnation of wickedness, but he is a savior to his children. He redeems them in his love, and he moves them, fill this in, from being slaves to sin to heirs to righteousness. So they're moved from slaves to heirs. Notice verse 7 there at the top of the, in the box. Look what it says. So you're no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir, not through your own righteousness, but through God. And so this is the glorious, glorious picture of why we sing, why we celebrate, why we do. Now, in light of everything on number one, of remembering the big picture of Christmas, number two on the backside of your sheet is that we may be warned, may we be warned of the big deception of Christmas. There is a grand deception, a cosmic deception in the world today. You see, Satan, fill it in, rages against God and all that is holy and true. He rages against what God has done. He rages against the image of God. He rages against the worship of God. He rages against the goodness of God. 
And he seeks to distort that. In fact, fill that in. Satan always has a distraction and or a distortion of the truths of God. And so he is called the prince of the power of the air. That's what Satan is called. In this present time, at this present age, he has been given a leash on which he is seeking to come and to destroy. But God is glorified by this picture of God redeeming his children out of this present darkness, coming and rescuing them, calling them to himself, calling them into the truth, out of the deception of this. And by faith that we respond to that, God is glorified in that. And so here we see that Satan, though, is always seeking to distract anything and everything he can do to distract. And we see that when it comes to the doctrine of the incarnation. It's not typically a frontal attack saying it didn't happen. It's merely another shiny object to get you to look at the shiny object somewhere else, to get you to focus on something else, to distract you from the real truth. You see, that's very often what a magician does, or that's very often what a thief will do. A thief will come to seek to get you to focus on something else so that he can cause you to have your attention there and not notice the truth of what is really happening. So he'll come up asking, can you tell me what time it is? Can you tell me what time? It is? And, and he'd say, look at my, you know, my watch. Is it, hmm? uh, we lived in France. And when you get on the rush hour subways in France, there's always somebody that is there. And they wait until it's really rush hour and everybody's packed in and everybody's crunched in. And I had a friend one time that had a big Navy coat on, one of those big kind of uh, full coats, and he, he had it on. He had a baby in his arms, and he knew the danger. He'd lived in France for a while, and that, you know, they all pack in, and he just remembers he's standing there, and, and as he was sitting there kind of looking at everybody, and they're all smunched in together, he thought, okay, I can feel what's going on. I know, I know I'm safe. I'm good. I've got my baby and everything, and he said, the doors open. A bunch of people jump out, and he steps out with his wife and his baby, and he realized, they got me. How did he do that? Friends, that is the cry of Christians when they realize the importance of Christmas. And they go, how did I miss this? How did I not see the beauty of the true message of Christmas for so long? Just before this service started, I was speaking with one of our young men up in the <laughs> media booth. And while we were there talking, he said, you know, for the longest time, I, I just kind of equated so much of the fairy tale that was around us and it, with, with Christmas. And he, he said, I even later, it wasn't until I became adult that I realized, did I believe in Jesus the way I believed in these other things? I actually asked myself that question. So we see that there's so often a distraction and a distortion. Satan wants us to do anything except, fill this in, he wants us to do anything except know God's truth and worship him. He, he wants us to do anything except know and worship, and by worship I also mean to obey. You know, when you're obeying the Lord, you're worshiping the Lord. You're coming to see who he is and what he's done. You know, we see this not only at Christmas, but we see it at, at what we call Easter time too, or Resurrection Sunday as well. I mean, bunnies don't lay eggs. I mean, it's so ridiculous. I mean, that's not the way. I know I just blew somebody's mind. You go, they don't? No, and they don't lay chocolate eggs. They lay other things that look like chocolate eggs. I mean, it, it is not at all what it seems. I mean, it's a royal distortion. Thank Thanksgiving is not about Black Friday. Thanksgiving is, is very different than these things. Amen. So very often when we, when we seek to have a focus on an important moment in, in worship of God, whether it be the incarnation or whether it be the death in the resurrection of Christ, or whether it be maybe just even an American national holiday, looking back to roots of the Puritans, which it, it was a good thing that they stopped and thanked God. We see these other distractions and distortions that come in that seek to keep us away from the truth and away from worship. 
So we need to be warned of this as God's people. You see, competing ideas, very quickly, I want you to notice the way this works a little bit. And the competing ideas, and and it can be for any of us, but it's especially dangerous for undiscerning persons. And I want you to circle there, especially children. We need to be very careful about how we how we move on this, because it can affect very deeply the spiritual life of these children who are going to grow up, and they're going to come into real adulthood. And we will either have given them a faith that they will grow into, or we will give them a faith that they will grow out of. So we need to be very careful that we see this and see that there are myths versus truths. And we need to be careful about what we present to undiscerning persons about myths versus truth. You see, what we see very often in in what has happened in Christmas land is letter B. It's a reversal of selfless giving to selfish expectation. We see in the heart of God him selflessly giving his son, Jesus selflessly giving himself. And so when we, when we see the manger, when we see the humility of God in coming to a poor couple to be raised by them and the generous nature of God in this way, when we take Christmas and we make it from a, instead of about giving to receiving, We raise children who, when they view Christmas, ultimately the things that trump everything else is, what am I going to get? What do you want for Christmas? What are you going to get for Christmas? What did you get for Christmas? I'm, I'm not trying to be the Grinch. I'm really not. I'm not trying to be Scrooge. I'm really not. I'm just trying to be a faithful pastor that helps Christians see the realities of the need to worship God. Look at letter C. Rejoicing. Here's the difference, the competing ideas. Rejoicing in God's salvation versus a great big excuse to party. Now, proper parties aren't a problem, but I can tell you, drunkenness and gluttony and everything else that goes on and on and on is a problem. You know, there's, there's people that die because they overeat at Christmas. They get really sick, and they already have a compromised um, medical problem, and because of, that we go on and on in this, it, I mean, it can happen. It's not just about that, but it, it's, it's about in general. I mean, what about, what about alcohol and Christmas? There's people who do real well all year long until December comes and the parties come, the work parties and the family parties and everything else. And maybe even Christians sometimes, that, that they're coming along and they come into a situation where, man, they just drink and they, they make a fool of themselves. They make a fool of their, of their family or maybe a fool of their faith. And so it's just, well, you know, it was Christmas. Be careful, Christians. Be careful, because the world's watching. And we're either showing them the loving, humble way of Christ. You don't go around going, yep, it's just water, just water, just water. That's all it is. It's just water. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that you be odd for God and a prude for Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, is that, there's, that there's deceptions that can make their ways even into the church where we start acting more like the world than we act. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that they are greatly harmed by their addiction to alcohol. It's destroying their lives. They lose their families. And some of them even die because of this. There's family members that have been slaughtered on the highways because of this around Christmas time. The man who hired me for a computer company here in Fort Lauderdale, it was at Christmas time that he had left a Christmas party up in Illinois and came down off the overpass and ran off into the side of the road, rolled his car, broke his neck, and died before I ever even started my work. He had just hired me. 
we, we see that we can either rejoice in God's salvation or we can be lost in a worldly party. This letter D fl- floats right along with letter C. Sweets, parties, and stuff versus spiritual truths requiring faith. We have, to, we have to be careful about this. We have to be careful that we don't look and, and see these things um, without a spiritual light. I mean, what, what's easier to gravitate toward in letter D? Sweets, parties, and stuff or spiritual truths that require faith? It's, 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 it's a little bit difficult at first to begin to see the things that really matter. What about letter E? Grace-based blessings versus performance-based loot. I mean, we sing about it. We, we really do. I mean, we, we're not talking about, I mean, the truth of the gospel is this is a grace-based, you didn't deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you. This is the way of God's great love in Christ Jesus. But we see in the human way, we are constantly thinking about this. Notice the lyrics that are on the screen. Let's read it out loud together. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town, right? How about this? He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows that you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Let, let's not mix up Jesus and his plan of salvation with the little guy in the red suit and his performance-based loot. There's a massive difference in the way God works. And we need to be very, very careful, especially when we're thinking about our children. And what they are learning. Number three, may we thoughtfully celebrate our giving God. You see, our God is a giving God. Satan wants you to think that God just, he doesn't give. He just takes, just demands. No, friends, listen, he he gave the store for you. He gave all that he had for you. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. God sent forth his son. How much more can you give? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He's a giving God. That's what God does. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Christ gave himself up for us. That's what it says. Christ gave himself up. Satan lies to us about these things. Oh, my friends, every carol, every Sunday, every community group when we meet, every Christmas hymn, may we worship the giving God. May we worship him. May we not let it escape us what the real meaning of this is all about. You see, the Christmas Eve service is planned at a very special moment. I mean, it is a beautiful time to gather, gather together after anticipating, anticipating, anticipating the, the Christ child's birth. The whole Old Testament people waited a thousand years, 1,500 years, 2,000 years for the coming Messiah. As we begin to see the promises made by God, a Messiah is going to come. They anticipated, they anticipated, they anticipated his coming. When will he come? When will he come and deliver us? And then he comes. When we celebrate Christmas Eve service on December the 24th, I'm telling you, it is a sweet time. It's a spiritual time. And yes, we are enjoying the lights. We're enjoying the music. We're enjoying one another. But I hope that it's all in worship of so great and generous a giving God. 
Here are some practical actions that you can put in place to honor Christ um, at Christmas. The first one is letter A, I want to encourage you to observe Advent as a family. I want to encourage you to make these evenings for the next 25 days very meaningful. And it can be very, very simple. And um, I, I just want you to notice, in our bookstore, we've, for all, all along, we have um, celebrated Advent by making, for years, available different Advent books. And there's a few of them in there. Um, I think we're actually out of these red ones, but there's some green ones that are there. And there's other ones that are, that are around at uh, some of the other stores in the area. But I want to encourage you, um, use one of the Advent books, hopefully a, a good one written by a solid author. But notice this next slide. I mean, we're talking about after dinner or something like that. I mean, that's, that's pretty brief. Look at how short that is. Just a little devotional where you can read. Can you read that, Marcio? You can't read that, can you? So, so you need one of these, right? I mean, that's, that's what you need, right? I saw him going, you know, yeah. Everyone needs one where you can begin to worship with your wife or with your husband. And I want to encourage you to take time. I, I, let me encourage you not to wait till bedtime. Why? Everybody's tired. Everybody's falling asleep, right? I want to encourage you to do it before bedtime. Maybe, maybe after dinner. Maybe just set aside a time. And I want to encourage you, no matter who's there, your mom and dad came into town or, you know, your neighbor is eating with you or somebody else, I, I want to encourage you to just do it, whoever's there. Whoever's not there, you, you do it anyway. This is a rich time. And then you can kind of ask. Each one of them will be about a, an aspect of the coming of Christ the life of Christ. And you can just maybe talk about it for a minute. What does that mean? What, 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 what do you think it meant by that? Having these moments to discuss the gospel is catechistic for us. It's, it's teaching us what we need to learn about the gospel. Um, I, I'm just interested. Do we have a, a dad here that maybe doesn't have one of these yet? Do, do you have a dad? Is anybody got a dad? And, okay, Gabriel, will you Will you, if I, if I give you one of these, will you do this with your family? You promise? All right. So, Gabriel, I, I'm going to just show you here. I, you have two readers, you and your wife, that can read, right? So, there you go. I'm going to give you two of them. And the reason I give them two of them is because it's good because when you have two of them, you, you, it's good to have everybody fall in a plot. These, these things cost a dollar, two, or three. They're, I mean, they're, they're inexpensive. I want to encourage you to make the effort to get the right resources and do it. And as you do that, I want to encourage you. Do we have a single mom here? Do we have a single mom? There's a single mom. Would you, how many readers do you have in your home? Just one. All right, there you go. So great, read that. Enjoy it. I want to encourage you, family. Get the resources that you need to teach your children about the Lord. There's all kinds of resources in the bookstore, whether for children or for adults. There's books that are, that are rather deep considerations. Some of you say, we don't have kids in the home anymore, and we kind of, whatever. Well, I want to say to you that there's great books on the incarnation in the bookstore that you can really consider the coming of Christ as an adult. So how much different many of our homes and many of our children would be when they go into adulthood if they're properly taught about the true meaning of Christmas, about the coming of Christ, that the loot does not overwhelm the message. Uh, I, I'll just say to you, I had a great mom and dad who loved the Lord, and they raised me even in this church. And let me tell you what, there were many times when Santa won over Jesus in my heart. You have to be diligent. Grandmas and grandpas, you have to be diligent. Equip your kids. Maybe you need to buy some of these and send them to Illinois. Or send them to wherever your family is. Notice that you need to use FedEx because it starts today for Advent. So um, notice the next part here, letter B. Go countercultural. Go countercultural. Tone down the above distractions that we've talked about. I encourage you to go against the flow. Um, pop culture is expensive and empty, and it's very temporary. But notice this. Christ culture is rich and free. That is the beautiful thing about the true meaning of Jesus 
in all of the true message of Christmas is it is free, 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 free. Notice the next part here. Look at letter C. Make gift giving a bigger anticipation than gift receiving. Make that for you. Maybe, you, maybe you're a retired couple and you've, you've already done the kids thing and, and everything else and you still have a few things that you do with family, but even for one another, that, that you would consider one another, um, that, you, that you're excited about a gift representing the, the glorious nature of what God has done at Christmas. That's okay. That's good. Make gift giving, a big, but especially among our children. May we cause them to think about giving and how God gave. May we cause them to see the beauty of that. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, let's read it out loud together. It's right under letter C. You see that, Acts 20 and verse 35. Let's read what it says. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Actively train as you say and do. Um, you know, for some, you would say, well, we don't have very much money. And I'd say that's, that's great. That's probably where most of us are. Dave Ramsey says, act your wage. Um, he doesn't say act your age. He says, act your wage. And that, that's, that's good advice for us. But for some, it's maybe your Christmas gift would be a beautiful poem. Maybe it would be a beautiful promise of service. Maybe it would be um, a special time, a special event as part of that is your gift giving. Um, the world wants you to think if you didn't spend enough, you didn't love enough. The reason that you didn't spend more is because you don't love as much. And friends, that's a lie from the pit. But letter D, this is important and it's different, but look at this, prayerfully plan and give a sacrificial offering to God. If you go back and you see the first offerings offered in the Bible, when you see Abraham's offering and the glorious offering that he give, gave, it was a sacrificial offering. It cost him. And I, I just want to encourage you to follow the wise men's example. They came bringing precious gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, we don't need any of you to bring frankincense and myrrh. I'm not sure what we would do with it in this present day and time. But bring your gold because what we'll do is we will send it overseas to allow missionaries to take the gospel to the darkest places of the planet. That's what that little lady over there is all about. It is an appropriate thing on Jesus' birthday to bring him a gift, doing what he said to do, which was to preach the gospel. A hundred percent of our Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes overseas. None of it stays in the United States. I want to encourage you to give sacrificially to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Marcy and I add up everything that we're giving to our children, to our parents, to each other, and everything else. We add all of that up, and then we give an amount equal to or greater than that amount to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. In fact, it's quite a bit more than that. I'm just giving you some calibration. We really give at Christmas time to the gospel going overseas. And I just want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to give sacrificially so IMB missionaries can stay overseas preaching the gospel. Look at letter E. Plan a Christ-sharing mission to others. Plan a Christ-sharing mission to others. Um, I, here's the idea. I want to encourage you that around all of this busyness of Christmas, whether you're, you have kids at home or whether you don't, there's much meaning in doing. There's much meaning in doing. And part of that, as Christians, when we think about how to minister to others in the sake of the gospel, that is a great thing to do. Other folks are out there running around trying to get the deals, trying to show off at the party, trying to do some of these things. And when you go love people that need to be loved, and when you take your children to do that, and you show them how to do that, friends, this is what preaches the gospel. What about visits to prison? I'm going to the jail. Um, more this season than I've been. So I'm going to go see people in the jail. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. I'm going to go see more shut-ins, people that can't get out. 
people that are stuck, people that are sick, people that are, that are they're really so incapacitated, they can't. I want to encourage you to do that. You know, it would be wonderful if you called the church office and said, hey, um, can you tell me someone in the life of our church that would love for me and my kids to stop by and just see them for a minute and maybe sing to them a little song or, or just take them a plate of cookies or to just stop by and tell them that we're thinking about them, take them a card. Listen, friends, this is the kind of thing, whether it's someone in the church or outside the church, I want to encourage you to make Christ sharing a great way to do that. Next Sunday, Stephen Cawthon, for any growth groups that want to come, any growth groups that would like to be there, we can communicate by email. Stephen Cawthon is going to be in the ministry center, and he's going to be talking about how to use the opportunity of Christmas in personal sharing. So we did an evangelism seminar a few weeks ago. Many of you came to that, and many of you said, golly, I miss that. I'd really like to come to that. I just want to encourage you, anybody that wants to come in the ministry center, 915 next summer, or next summer, um, next Sunday, <laughs> Christmas will be over if you wait till Christmas, <laughs> next summer. At 915, Stephen's going to have some things laid out there and talk about how to use Christmas strategically. And uh, you'll still have three weeks to do that. So I want to encourage you to allow the true meaning of Christmas to grip your heart. Maybe some of you have come and you've heard our, the gospel message this morning, the fact that Jesus came to die for your sins. Oh, friend, don't leave this room today without receiving not just the Christ child baby, but listen to this, the Savior who died on a cross that you might be free. And not just free, but that you would be his heir that receiving the inheritance of God.